from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good evening. I'm Karen Lloyd. As director of the Veterans History Project and as the retired Army aviator, and I'm also the widow, sibling, and child of veterans, I am so pleased to welcome you, especially the veterans, to the Library of Congress. The Library makes a special effort this week in particular to honor and recognize veterans and their families and explore the ways military men and women have connected to home and family during and after service from World War I through the current conflicts. We are proud to collaborate with our colleagues in the publishing office and the Kluge Center to offer a series of events titled Coming Home, Veterans Day at the Library of Congress. Out where the book sales are occurring, you will find a handy card handy card with all these this week's programs. I ask you to consider coming back for the ones on Saturday, many of which align with our exhibit, Echoes of the Great War. This exhibit examines the upheaval of the World War as Americans confronted it, both at home and abroad. Located in the Jefferson Building, it is compellingly rendered, offering glimpses of the human condition transcendent of time and place, in part through over 30 collections from the Veterans History Project. Also, please take a copy of the library's magazine, which focuses in, in part on the Veterans History Project and our collections. The Veterans History Project provides inspiration and instruction to foster a nationwide volunteer effort for individuals to reach out to the veterans in their lives and communities and listen, really listen, and then donate those oral histories and first-person narratives of their veterans from World War I through the current conflicts. Veterans like Mr. Reston, who graci graciously donated his interview to VHP this afternoon, and whom my esteemed colleague Betsy Clark, Becky Clark, will share more about shortly. Becky? Thank you, Karen. Um, before we get started, I just want to um, let you know that we're recording this for further uh, uh, distribution on the library's website so if you do have a device that makes noise and can take a moment to silence it we, we certainly would appreciate it. Um, my name is Becky Brasington Clark I'm director of the Library of Congress publishing office and I'm delighted to be here tonight. I want to thank the Veterans History Project and the John W. Kluge Center for hosting this book talk with James Reston Jr. author of A Rift in the Earth, Art, Memory, and the Fight for a Vietnam War Memorial. Jim conducted a great deal of his research for this book during his term as a Kluge Fellow. He came to the publishing office at the suggestion of Kluge's own Mary Lou Rieger, who's in the audience tonight, who encouraged Jim to ask us if we might work with him to develop his manuscript. Managing editor Peggy Wagner, also in the audience, shared my opinion that his proposal looked wildly promising, and Jim spent the next few months in our office as senior editor Susan Rayburn, editorial assistant Hannah Fries, both in the audience, and photo researcher Athena Angelos worked with him to sculpt a work that has subsequently earned endorsements from Ken Burns, John Kerry, John McCain, James Fallows, and Bobby Ann Mason. Not a bad lineup. So the other day I was puzzling over how best to introduce Jim when a college friend posted on Facebook a photo from the fall of 1980. There I am, wearing dark glasses and a funny hat, engaged in some silly doo-wop dance with my buddies in the hall of our dorm. We are coffee-guzzling super nerds, probably taking a late night break from the books to blow off steam. I can't tell you for certain because I have absolutely no memory of this event. It undoubtedly happened because there's a picture of it. But it hasn't been part of my history before now because it hadn't had had no place in my memory. There I was, and there it is, a sliver of my own past, commemorated in a photo unseen by me over the ensuing 37 years. As it turns out, the competition to design a memorial to the Vietnam War opened about a month after that dorky photo of me was taken. 
And as you'll discover in Jim's wonderful new book, the history of that competition and the resulting art wars over the selection of Maya Lin's design have also been hidden from view for the past three decades. Today, we know the Vietnam Veterans Memorial as simply the wall, not just a structure, but a deeply moving experience that attracts three million visitors annually. Many, if not most of those visitors, are unaware of the roiling controversy that accompanied the selection of Maya Lin's design and the fact that a vigorous campaign to stop it almost succeeded. A Rift in the Earth uncovers that history and recounts it in a vivid narrative that reflects the difficulty of honoring those who fought and died in an unconventional and deeply unpopular war. In the process, Jim Rustin forces us to confront some of the unreliable and very human dynamics that shape our perceptions of reality and history, memory, perspective, opinion, and taste. The book's greatest revelation may be that the Vietnam Veterans Memorial is a result of a difficult compromise, a forced marriage of two very different artistic visions. A rift in the earth underscores this compromise as an impulse not of resignation, but of generosity. Two very different pieces of art share one public space, reminding us so many years later of the importance of making room for opinions we neither understand nor trust. James Rustin Jr. was an assistant to Secretary of the Interior Stuart Udall before serving in the U.S. Army in the Vietnam era from 1965 to 1968. He is the best-selling author of 17 books, including The Conviction of Richard Nixon, The Untold Story of the Frost-Nixon Interviews, which helped inspire the 2008 film Frost-Nixon, uh, in which Jim had a walk-on role. He's also written three plays and numerous articles in The New Yorker, Vanity Fair, and The New York Times Magazine. He won the Pre Italia and the DuPont Columbus Award for his NPR radio documentary, Father Cares, The Last of Jonestown. It is a deep pleasure to introduce Jim Rustin. So who said you can't come home again? <laughs> This is an inside joke between two North Carolinians here. Um, so uh, this book is t is totally a product of the Library of Congress. Uh, and how did it come to be? Well, two, more than two years ago, uh, I had the idea of a dual biography. I had done dual biographies before. Um, Pete Rose and Bart Jumadi, Sue and uh, Richard the Lionheart and Saladin. So the form of two competing figures uh, interested me a lot, and I thought perhaps uh, this uh, might work. Uh, beyond that, the r whole matter of reconciliation after divisive war is something that is deep in my thinking over the last 40 years or so. Uh, my first book was a novel that uh, very much was a Vietnam generation novel with all the angst that uh, that uh, can, uh, can have. My first nonfiction book was a, a tale of uh, the return of a deserter from Paris to become a moral test on the morality or immorality of the Vietnam War. And then in 1985, there was Sherman's March in Vietnam which uh, focused on the historical parallel between the post-Civil War era and the post-Vietnam era. So re reconciliation is an enduring uh, passion of mine, uh, but would anybody be interested in this uh, old tale of a memorial in, in Washington? My agent was profoundly disinterested in the whole thing. But then several things uh, happened along the way. Uh, first of uh, it was that uh, I came to a lecture here uh, on Martin Luther. That was the subject of my book before this one. And there encountered Mary Lou Reeker. And um, I told her what was on my mind and bless her heart. She said, well, why don't you come to the Kluge Center as a visiting uh, fellow and work on, on it here? Uh, that was a fabulous invitation. 
Um, because as I started to look into the treasures that uh, are here in the Library of Congress, the 80 or more boxes of original uh, primary material for, from the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Fund, the 1,421 submissions uh, for this uh, incredible commission. Uh, the historical record was so deep and it had to be ferreted out in the various divisions at the Library of Congress, the newspaper division, the motion picture, the recorded sound, uh, the prints and, and photographs. So the, this was an absolute uh, gift, not only of of a place uh, to write, but but uh, also with these primary uh, sources right there at your fingertips. And then I heard that there was going to be a documentary come out about the Vietnam War. I actually encountered a um, advisor at Dartmouth College who was an advisor to Ken Burns. And he asserted that the Ken Burns documentary on the Vietnam War would exceed the reputation of Ken Burns's um, Civil War s series. So I asked the critical question, well, um, when is this documentary series going to come out? And he said, well, it would be two years. And I thought, aha, that's about the time that it takes me to write a book. And so I'm happy to report to you that A Rift in the Earth was published the day before the first segment of, um, of the Ken Burns documentary series. That's not so easy to accomplish as, a, as an author, I want you to know. So um, there was this nine months or so uh, time in the, in the um, wonderful space of the Kluge Center with, uh, with Mary Lou and the other really very, very interesting scholars all around me. It was perfect. Uh, perfect working place. Uh, and I ended up with a manuscript that needed a little bit of work. And um, that's how um, Becky Clark came into the uh, picture, absolutely um, embracing this notion. But beyond that, um, offering me more of these wonderful resources uh, at the Library of Congress. An absolutely brilliant editor by the name of Sue Rayburn, um, a, um, a ferocious, ferocious fact checker and researcher by the name of Hannah Fries, a very professional um, photo researcher. And of course, we had to cull down from the 1,421 uh, submissions to this thing down to a gallery of photographs. Um, so it took a village. And um, that's how the manuscript was then readied for submission to New York. And it was certainly a new experience for our, my very fine editor in New York to receive a manuscript that was so perfect you know, that needed very little editing on, uh, on his part. Uh, so, uh, so that, uh, that worked, worked very well indeed. Um, now we are going through this most extraordinary experience with this Ken Burns uh, series, this national reconsideration of the Vietnam War the first American defeat in its uh, national history, uh, portrayed in such graphic uh, detail that it is my view that, uh, that war will never again be so graphically uh, chronicled. The horror, the loss, the resistance to the war. Um, and uh, I have done a little bit of talking about this around the country. and when there are people under 40 in the audience who hopefully watched a little bit of the Ken Burns thing, it, it seems to me they must think that 
the America that's portrayed in that series is something on Mars or Pluto or something like that. It is just so far from the experience that uh, the current um, younger generation has had. Well, I've been strongly um, arguing that there's not one Vietnam War, but two. The first began in uh, 1959 and ended in 1975. The second Vietnam War began in 1979 and is going on still because we're still fighting over the issues that the Vietnam War uh, raises. Who is to blame? Who is to blame more? Was it a dishonorable enterprise? Was it immoral or was it a noble cause? Was it a dismal mistake or was it a, 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 a fine upstanding fight for a beleaguered small nation that was uh, being attacked from, from elsewhere? These questions are car carrying on um, as we speak and, and will, I, I think, the resonance of the Ken Burns uh, series and the books about Vietnam that are published to now will um, continue this, this very interesting debate that's going on about what the Vietnam experience uh, amounted to. My preoccupation is my generation and the choices that uh, that generation faced to serve or to avoid service, to flee to Canada, to avoid it uh, legally or in a suspect uh, sort of way to get out of it. So for all of us, all of us who face those choices, um, it's personal. It's personal. Every one of that generation has a, a story. It includes the women, obviously. Um, and um, so, Many of us faced moral dilemmas in that war uh, and in that era. My personal decision had uh, involved three years of uh, service in uh, uh, army intelligence, but uh, I would have to say of my very distinguished uh, class at the University of North Carolina, I know of none who went into the military all of them virtually uh, avoided. And now in, uh, in their older age, I experience not infrequently a kind of quiet guilt amongst those who avoided it as if you know, this was the war of our generation and I was not a participant. The statistics are revealing 26 uh, million men were uh, eligible. 15.4, that is the majority of those elig eligible, uh, were deferred, exempted, disqualified, or avoided in, in some way or another. 2 million uh, de were def deployed to Vietnam. 58,000 died as we know, but what we don't talk about as much is that 300,000 were wounded. There were something like 5 million gallons of Agent Orange dioxin dumped on that landscape, and 245,000 men have applied for disability from Agent Orange. 8 million tons of ordnance were dropped on Vietnam, uh, many of that, uh, those bombs remain unexploded and 8,000 Vietnamese have died from unexploded or from, from unexploded ordnance that exploded uh, for them, including a number of children. Two million Vietnamese uh, died. Uh, there are no statistics on how many uh, of those who were in Vietnam su suffer from psychological uh, difficulties. There were 50,000 exiles to Canada and, and, sw and Sweden. This is the cost of war for that uh, generation. 
So the question that that generation asks or uh, either quietly uh, or when they are confronted, wh what did you do? What, what are you proud of? What are you sorry for? Uh, what stirs you uh, or makes you angry? Uh, what, what do you d admire and what do you deplore? Um, so um, for the women, who do they sympathize with? The fighting men or the resistor or, um, or what? So um, this was your generation's war. Did you participate? So I operated on both sides of this thing. I had those three years in, uh, in the Army by um, chance. I was not deployed to Vietnam, but I happened to run, uh, oh, run into a letter that uh, was an exchange between myself and, and the recruiter for Army Intelligence back in 1965 who said, yes, we'll, we'd be glad to have you in the program that you want uh, and then type, send you to language school, but it'd probably be Vietnamese. Uh, it turned out by chance to be Japanese. So that's just was the luck of, of the draw. Um, but those three years gave me an enduring sympathy for the soldier, for the fighting man in harm's way, no matter what the war is. Um, I then became very deeply involved in the whole amnesty movement for um, the Vietnam exiles. Uh, could they come home? Under what circumstances could they come home? Would they have to admit that they... Uh, did something wrong to c to come home? Uh, that was the nature of the uh, the original pardons by Jimmy Carter, was a pardon, and it is at the base of the concept of pardon that you have done something wrong for which you uh, you must be pardoned. Uh, that's why the term amnesty was so important to to those who uh, were trying to get the exiles home. So over two years ago, I happened onto this uh, remarkable story that brought these uh, issues into play in a very fresh and different way, I thought. It was a drama over a work of art. And I had never written about art before. Uh, it had and has a fascinating set of characters. Um, it involves profound questions about patri patriotism, particularly patriotism when the enterprise is deeply flawed, possibly immoral, um, definitely started under fa false pre pretenses. What is the nature of patriotism under those circumstances? It had really, really rather wonderful issues of artistic integrity. When someone wins a competition, will that uh, work of art be um, uh, changed in any, any way? Would it be changed um, un involuntarily? So there was this intersection of, of art and memory and politics that I thought was really pr pretty wonderful. So there were two uh, emotional uh, roots for for this book. Um, one was that I was quite friendly with Frederick Hart, who was the sculptor of the uh, three statues that uh, eventually were placed in the uh, <coughs> in the Vietnam um, Memorial. He was a brilliant artist, and I uh, spent a lot of time with him in the 1990s before he passed away. Uh, talking about this controversy that he had been right at the center of. The other emotional root was that uh, I have a friend that I served with who is on the wall and was killed in, um, uh, in the Tet Offensive in um, January of 1968. So those were the, uh, those were the emotional uh, roots of the thing that really uh, got me going. Now, where is the page that I want to read from here? Um, 
so out of this um, this competition that was very very professional, um, there uh, there was this astonishing winner, Asian American, twenty one years old, knew absolutely nothing about the Vietnam War. Indeed, her basic design uh, that um, she presented to her class at Yale University was profoundly political, and it was uh, an absolute taboo for the uh, for the uh, applicants to this to this competition that that the uh, submission say anything for or against the um, the Vietnam War itself. Her drawing, uh, which you can see down in Princeton uh, photographs, the original panel that, uh, that she presented, um, was really rather elementary and almost high schoolish. Uh, it was just this little black chevron in, in a wash of um, oriental blue. Um, but more important than that, in a way, is that it was meant to be below ground uh, of black granite with no American flag, no inscription about service and duty and courage, much less about valor and heroism. Uh, and it was a wonderful um, revelation to me as a writer that what really won her the competition was not her high schoolish drawing at all, but her description of her vision. And it went like this. So walking through this park-like area, the memorial appears as a rift in the earth, a long polished black stone wall emerging from and receding into the earth. Approaching the memorial, the ground slopes gently downward and the low walls emerging on either side, growing out of the earth, extend and converge at a point below and ahead. Walking into this grassy site contained by the walls of the memorial, we can barely make out the carved names upon the memorial's walls. These names, seemingly infinite in number, convey the sense of overwhelming numbers while unifying these individuals into a whole. That won her the, uh, the commission, not her design. Now there was a, a, um, a terrific blowback to this uh, design that um, happened sub rosa instantaneously but did not really emerge for another three or four months. Uh, it was uh, spearheaded by a very, very uh, competent, indeed eloquent, and tough group of uh, veterans who absolutely despised the memorial design. The leader was Jim Webb, uh, later senator uh, from Virginia and briefly presidential candidate, along with Ross Perot, about as tough uh, an adversary as one uh, could find in, a, in America. And they set out to scuttle and undermine this. They asserted that black was the color of shame and that it was below ground um, and that it had no inscription about courage and duty and, and, and honor. There was no American flag. And so what they wanted was to kill it and to have another a competition altogether that would um, would be judged by uh, by Vietnam veterans uh, solely, that would be uh, above ground of white granite, would have an American flag, would have an inscription about honor, uh, with only Vietnam veterans as the as the judges. Well, this was a ferocious, vicious four-year uh, art war, um, intense 
and racist and um, disgusting in many ways. And in the midst of it all was this 21-year-old, then 22-year-old young uh, Asian American uh, woman who was just as tough as uh, Ross Perot or uh, Jim Webb. And her story is really quite remarkable. So here it was. Um, the design had been chosen in the most professional way. Now there was this blowback from these uh, very uh, uh, competent and, and eloquent uh, veterans who started to ply the, the, uh, the corridors of Congress to get Congress people uh, against this, uh, who went to the Secretary of the Interior that had, his, uh, had the purview over the mall where this was supposed to be built, uh, and the opposition was uh, absolutely um, ferocious. Bills were put in Congress to insist upon a new, uh, uh, a new uh, competition. Uh, all of this uh, got fought out in a little agency of uh, the federal government called the U.S. Commission on Fine Arts. Well, ultimately, um, there was a compromise. Uh, it emerged out of uh, a congressional... Um, uh, meeting with Senator John Warner of Virginia pre uh, presiding. And in the narrative of that uh, meeting, probably orchestrated, uh, somewhere four hours into the discussion or something, a general stood up and said, well, why don't we have a statue that would go, a statue of a soldier that would, would um, be imposed upon the myelin wall. Well, to begin with, that was a uh, an, uh, uh, an absolute violation of the artistic uh, integrity of the myelin design that was fairly won. Um, and um, there uh, preceded this really quite interesting debate between the uh, the artistic side and the veterans and Maya Lin and some of these characters. Well, ultimately a statue uh, was uh, agreed to and my friend Frederick Hart was asked to do, do it. But the question was, what should the statues look like? What the general who proposed this uh, wanted was something like exists in, the f in Fort Benning in Georgia, uh, which is a leader of, uh, of a combat uh, group going up a hill. Follow me, follow me. And uh, the artistic uh, group, and indeed the, the um, ones behind the statue itself were horrified at this notion. How? How awful would that be to have some sort of glorified soldier imposed upon the 40, 58,000 names of the, of the dead? Well, Frederick Hart was under considerable pressure to do exactly that thing, to, to design artistically uh, a sculpture that would present an idealized form of the soldier. Um, but he rejected that to his great credit. Uh, he rejected the notion that his statue should, should uh, have the feeling of glory or, uh, or valor or gallan gallantry. And instead, what he was looking for in the affect of, these, of the statues was youth and camaraderie uh, and confusion uh, and awe. Uh, and um, some people believe that the way in which he was deferential to the um, uh, to the myelin uh, design was uh, what saved the memorial uh, to be built. And here's what he wrote in a way 
his language was just as um, eloquent as Maya Lin's had been in her original uh, vision. So Hart said about his statues, the gesture and expression of the figures are directed to the wall, affecting an interplay between image and metaphor. The tension between the two elements creates a resonance that echoes from one to the other. I see the wall as a kind of ocean, a sea of sacrifice that is overwhelming and nearly incomprehensible in its sweep of names. I place these figures upon the shore of that sea, gazing upon it, standing vigil before it, reflecting the human face of it, the human heart. Well, I think that uh, was a great blessing to the whole project, and it then went forward. Well, the great magic of that uh, memorial uh, to me um, is not only that it's just the most successful war memorial in history. Uh, f really, five million are, sub are going a year. Uh, it has influenced all the building of war memorials since that time. When I was in Vietnam in uh, December, I was taken to a cemetery for, uh, for uh, North Vietnamese dead. And how is it portrayed? Black granite with the names of the fallen, the individual names. But there's been an evolution of this uh, memorial. It is dynamic. It, it, um, it moves. It changes. It began as a veterans memorial. And veterans insist that you use that term. It's a Vietnam veterans memorial. Uh, but it has transcended a veterans memorial. And it has, in my view, transcended the war in Vietnam itself. Uh, it is a place uh, for all of the generation of, of Vietnam, the soldiers, the combat soldiers, those who resisted, those who, who were exiled. So it embraces that, in, that whole experience. It is a Vietnam War memorial. So it is a place not just for warriors, but as much for pacifists. Uh, it has transcended the specific war itself and has become a memorial about all wars. It has become a place of contemplation for all wars, almost spiritual in feel, uh, a place of, of reflection on the cost of war. That's extraordinary. Now, we mentioned reconciliation. Uh, some, perhaps my involvement in the amnesty movement had had a dollop of atonement in it for having served in a war that I didn't uh, believe in in the end. Um, when I was in Vietnam in December, I encountered a Marine who uh, is uh, spending his life teaching a high school in Dong Ha. Is that atonement? Um, there is this incredible fellow, uh, Chuck Searcy, who uh, was trained as I was in Army Intelligence, who spent the last 20 years of his life uh, living in Vietnam and um, searching and heading the search for unexploded ordnance. Is that atonement? Um, so this was a time of, of, um, of conflict, of, of, um, of great dissension within the breast of almost everybody who was of, of, um, of age at that time. Um, I end the book, perhaps this is a personal, um, a personal 
reconciliation within me. I'm not sure. Uh, I am sitting at a tea house beside the Hoam Kiam Lake in the old quarter of Hanoi. At last the week-long rain has stopped and a full moon is rising through the mist. I've waited for Dr. Nguyen Ngoc Hung, professor of English, a former government minister of education, and a veteran of the battles around Hue. And for Bao Nin, Nin is Vietnam's most famous writer and the author of an astonishing phantasmagoric novel called The Sorrow of War. When it was published in England in 1993, the Independent hailed the book as a masterpiece, saying it, quote, vaunts over all the American fiction that came out of the Vietnam War to take its place alongside the greatest war novel of the century, Eric Maria Remarque's classic, All the All uh, Quiet on the Western Front. So, um, hold on. So Dr. Kong Hung arrived alone, apologizing that he had been unable to reach his friend Bao Nin, who had apparently dropped out of sight and had thrown away his cell phone. He had had enough of the taunting of other Vietnamese writers who were jealous of his international fame and of the Vietnamese government that had banned his book for 10 years and was now denying him its highest literary prize. I was only mildly disappointed. I had heard that despite his literary mastery, Bao Nin in person was shy and incommunicative. Dr. Hung, white-haired with an oval brown face, a gentle affect and thoughtful manner, had earned a PhD in Australia and his fluency was a great relief to me. I told him I had seen the shrines, the tunnels of Viet Mok and Cu Chi, the museums in Hanoi and Ho Chi Chi Minh City, the heroic statue of Thich Quang Duc, the tiger cages of Khon Son prison. If collective fury exists, existed, it seemed to be more directed against the Chinese and the French than the Americans. Among the people, as far as I could tell, there was no gloating about victory over the United States. Why was it, I asked eventually, that there is so little triumphalism in Vietnam? For an answer to that, he replied, you have to go deep into history. For a thousand years, the Chinese invaded Vietnam, coming every 30 to 50 years to plunder the country and make it a vassal state. Then the French came for a hundred years with their arrogant quest to civilize the country through their brutal colonialism. And after they left in 1954, there was only a brief respite before you came to impose your American brand of freedom and democracy. You stayed only 15 years. But why, I persisted, after all the bombing, several million deaths, the poisoning of the land, was there no more anger and resentment? Because, he replied, we fought the war differently than you. You measured success by how many soldiers you killed and how many weapons you seized. We lost every battle. Whenever 30 of us went out on an ambush, we were lucky if 15 returned. But it was never our intention to defeat you. Indeed, 1968, the year when your friend was killed, was the worst year for us. There were no more soldiers left, and the government had to scrape the barrel to find more men like me, students and women. But we fought only to make the Americans go away. Why don't I see images of valiant, heroic fighters everywhere, I asked. Because, he answered, we do not glorify soldiers. We remember the suffering of the women for their husbands and their sons. You will find no Rambos here. We only go to war when we can't avoid it. Our patriotism is like a lump of charcoal. When it is left alone, it is dormant and harmless. If you light it, it burns very hot. It can start a big fire and spread rapidly until it consumes a whole forest. 
But when it is over, it is over, and we focus on peace and rebuilding. He looked out on the lake. This lake is called Ho Huan Kiam, he said, and a legend is associated with it, the legend of the returned sword. In 1428, a fisherman came here, and from the depths, a tortoise emerged and handed him a magical golden sword from heaven. On its simple wooden handle was written, to save a nation. The fisherman became a great man, an emperor, to defend Vietnam against the invasion of the Ming dynasty of China. After many years, this king prevailed against the Chinese. After his victory, he returned here to this lake, magical sword in hand, and a giant golden tortoise surfaced from the depths and snatched it away, restoring it to its divine owners and leaving the king with only its wooden handle. The war was over. The sword was now useless. We are proud of this legend, Dr. Hung said. Its message is deep in our culture and our character. I thanked him for his time, and we parted with a warm handshake, and I watched him fearlessly navigate across a busy thoroughfare through the swarm of motorbikes without a backward glance. Thank you. Thank you very much. Not? <laughs> yes, ma'am. That's an interesting uh, story. Um, I had preliminary uh, interchanges with her by email, and um, it seemed that that was going to, do, to be fine. I actually made a mistake and went to the wrong place when she was lecturing here in Washington where we were supposed to sort of begin our relationship. But as I got more deeply into this thing and also uh, talked to people who knew her very well, it became very, very clear that even now, 35 years later, the whole experience of building this wall despite the fact that it secured her international fame, is a very, very unpleasant memory for her. And I, what I wanted to do from the literary standpoint was to put the reader into that fight in uh, the early 80s and late, uh, late 70s. And I made the decision that it really... I didn't think that I wanted to pursue that relationship with her. Um, to begin with, it would be a 35 or 40 year memory, and that's always for the historian a, uh, a difficulty. Uh, but beyond that, I, in this deep research here in this wonderful place, the, I realized that the historical record was so rich that I really could put the, the reader in those years, 79 to 84, without her. So we had a few deflective um, emails along the way. Uh, she uh, said very clearly she didn't really want to talk about this. So, so the answer is no, I've never met her. Yes, ma'am. You go ahead. My question is, there are many Vietnam veterans who will share that they didn't understand why they were there. And <coughs> I, feel, I feel badly for them. <coughs> Sorry. And from your research and study and your involvement, did you feel that our <coughs> administration and politicians at the time adequately informed the public as to why you were there? A absolutely not, and it couldn't be more clear from the uh, from the Ken Burns documentary uh, about uh, that very thing about how much was kept from uh, from the American people as this thing 
uh, preceded most especially how um, confused and bewildered they were about how this could be brought to some sort of a successful conclusion at the same time that they were asking tens and tens of thousands of young men to go uh, and fight for these totally forgettable hills uh, all over that country and then abandoning them and so forth. So there is um, a very complicated, I think, psychology of those who have, uh, uh, who were involved in the toughest stuff in, uh, in Vietnam. Um, we've had some wonderful literature that has, has come out about it, but it's all fraught with, um, with this, uh, this confusion about why, wh why am I here? Why, wh what am I fighting for? Uh, I was at a uh, conference at the Wilson Center here uh, with Ken Burns about uh, three weeks ago. And um, at one point this subject came up and Burns said, you know, in the Civil War, uh, a soldier fought for God, uh, for country, for region, for town, for village, for wife, for children. In the Vietnam War, they fought for one another. And a general there, General McCaffrey, talked about going out to uh, talk to his men before they went into com combat. And this question would come up, why, what are you fighting for? What are we fighting for? And McCaffrey said in this Wilson Center thing, uh, you're fighting, f he said to his troops, you're fighting for the guy on your right and the guy on your left. And I thought, what a low star is that anyway to, uh, to ask a whole generation to, uh, to risk their lives for. So um, this is an in immensely complicated era of American history, but it goes down from the macrocosm to the microcosm. Uh, so um, yeah, that would be my answer. I was talking about the entire art war, as it's kind of come to be called. That it be, it really begins with this remarkable character, Jan Scruggs, back in 1977, with his with uh, several um, several op-ed pieces that he did, 77, 78, and then devoted his life to this uh, to this uh, passion. Uh, and then in 79, Jimmy Carter. Uh, uh, invites Congress to, um, to um, make this possible. And then in 1980, he, uh, it, it uh, gets congressional approval. So um, it, the competition comes in the beginning of 1981. And the uh, dedication of the memorial is in November of 1982. But then it is two more years before Frederick Hart's statues are uh, are, um, in, are 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 added to to the whole thing. So that's that's why I was using that seventy nine to eighty four time frame. And um, in the discussion involving the, many things were said about the wall during those days, and one of them was that it was a black gash of shame. Right. And I was wondering if you ever met General. Uh, no, I didn't meet, but but uh, General Price uh, is an African American general, uh, and there is a critical moment in this very debate uh, in the uh, Senator Warner meeting about trying to come to some sort of a com compromise that will save the memorial, in which uh, the opponents of Myelin keep talking about this black gash of of shame and and. Uh, Price had had enough of it, and he stood up 
and he said, I, anybody who talks anymore about the color of black uh, being associated with shame, you come and talk to me. Well, I wish that I had, had, had heard it personally, but it's a, it's a, a very dramatic moment in that, uh, in that whole, whole discussion, and he's, uh, uh, at least from the literature, a very, very impressive man. Yes, he still is, yes. Yes. And uh, my third question is, in your, in your reference to how Vietnam veterans have dealt uh, with the aftermath of the war and what they're doing, whether it's teaching in schools in Vietnam or whatever course they have chosen for their life, your overriding theme seems to be one of atonement I would question that. I don't know that that I think that's the main emotion that uh, Vietnam veterans. I don't. I don't think a lot of Vietnam veterans feel we have anything to atone for. Yes. Well, I, I, you're absolutely right, and that's a very a point, very well taken. What I, the way I should have expressed that is that there, there is a range of emotions. And of course, there is a, a great number of Vietnam veterans who are proud of their service and um, have no qualms about, uh, about anything. Um, this generation got sliced and diced. It got put into segments. Uh, there were, you know, there were the, the ones who fought in the combat and then there were the ones that were there. Uh, but not in combat, and then there were those in the ships, and then there were people like me back home that never went to Vietnam, and, and, and then there were the resistors, and then there were the exiles, and, and so forth. But even within the group of Vietnam veterans themselves that were in the tough stuff, there is a, is a, a great um, um, range of emotion. And atonement is one of them, one of them. Uh, it is not the dominant one. Uh, it is something that I have experienced um, personally with a number uh, with a number of people. But I would certainly not represent, and I absolutely agree with you that this is the dominant uh, emotion. And along those same lines, um, I, I want to be clear about what you said about Jerry McCaffrey's comment. Right. Right. And, and your comment was that that was a bad. Yes, by comparison to the to the Civil War story, I mean that that, you know, what do young men go to war for? Right. And um, if it's only a sort of a macho experience, and you know, you're in tough stuff and you're just trying to survive, well, every war has that including the Civil War, that you're fighting for your buddies as well as all these other things. But it is as if the Vietnam War is devoid of those, you know, if you will, more noble uh, sentiments. Uh, not for everybody, not for everybody, but uh, of you know, of a noble cause, a just war, a just cause. Uh, and if it's only, only about what's happening in the battlefield, there's something missing there. That's my point. Yeah, well, I think Jerry McCaffrey's uh, reason for that statement was because it was such a difficult conflict on so many levels. But when you're in the field, when you're in a situation where it's life and death, does come down to it's, it's you and your buddies. You all, you, all they're trying to do is survive. I get it. Uh, I do get it. Uh, and um, that's absolutely true of this war and all wars. Um, but we're talking here about a unique experience in American history, uh, a 13-year war that America lost that is a defeat. Uh, and we are still trying to grapple with how that happened. Uh, and for those who did participate in the thing, much less who participated in the toughest stuff of all, there are some pretty profound questions that come out of that.
in the mid-80s when she spoke at the Walt, and she, I think she said maybe eight sentences in her presentation at the Walt, and, and the most poignant one was, I built this wall for you. And she didn't really have anything more to say about it. And she said, I, I leave it to you. Right, well, who's the audience? And the question is, who's the, what's the you? And it is my point that the you is now far expanded from what the original, her original concept was. That it was, she, was, she was hired by veterans, and it was a veterans memorial to begin with. But now, if you go to, uh, to the wall, you see these young fathers and mothers with their small children that are in their 30s or something like that. Uh, they're not Vietnam veterans. So what are they thinking about? They're certainly not thinking about play coup or Dan Da Nang or any of that. They're there to soak up this spiritual feeling that everybody seems to experience uh, about uh, war in general and the cost of war. And Maya Lin says that very thing in, um, in uh, some of her statements along the way, that that's what, what the war was about, was it about the cost of war. Yes, yeah, so you, you had something you wanted. Uh, yes, there's some there's a little some a few little anecdotes about that sort of thing. I happened to uh, run into someone out in my uh, neighborhood in Bethesda who was involved with uh, a family that lost someone in um, 1958 who was there as a CIA uh, person, and he was uh, so he was killed, and it be, it took a a uh, congressional uh, action to get his name onto the wall. So in that sense, the, the uh, scope of the war was widened from 59 back to 58, or certainly before fi 59. So there's that. Then there <coughs> there's the whole category of the missing in action, some of whom have been uh, identified, and some were identified after the engraving took place, so they, they've been added uh, since. Right. Do you have something else on your mind? Yes. Well, um, I would invite you all, I expect you've all been, I would invite you to go multiple times. And uh, apropos of this particular question, to look at who's there. And uh, it's not just a gnarly veteran who has got all his medals and his fatigues on who was in, uh, in the Vietnam War itself. Not at all. I mean, it is the general population and a great deal of young, uh, young people in the, in the whole thing. Uh, so. That's the transformation of the of the memorial into this magical spiritual space. Yes. Um, I was, uh, I gave a talk at a literary festival in North Car Western North Carolina about a month ago, and that wall, that moving wall was coming uh, a month, month later to the little town of Burnsville, North Carolina above uh, Asheville. So I know about that whole thing. Um, I think Sue Rayburn here wanted me to m pay more attention to that, and I sort of avoided the whole thing. But that... Um, <coughs> it's another just ama amazing thing about the uh, reverberations of this one piece of art. So, 
Good. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. You. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.